Hello, every folks, and good morning. So, I see a question come up in the comments all the time. What is the crafting and what does it do? Let's go ahead and get into this thing. So, first and foremost, uh, crafting unlocks in Chapter 2, uh, basically right as you get your first crafting book. It'll uh, give you a little pop-up that says, hey, if you go to the store, you get to craft some stuff now, and so you immediately do so. Um, you can immediately find a wide variety of different recipes at the store. Uh, you start off with uh, melee, uh, ranged, armor, jewelry, ores, timber, textiles, and medicine. I believe medicine is the one that it actually uh, starts you off with, but uh, either way, um, I believe the trigger is technically whichever crafting... If you get a crafting book, you unlock crafting. It's not an important detail, but either way. Um, once you open it, you might as well go uh, go and uh, get all of the crafting books that are available. You should really do this uh, anytime that happens. Uh, there's only two times that'll happen uh, in Chapter 2 and uh, round, uh, roundabouts, I believe, like late Chapter 3, early Chapter 4 uh, is when the second ones start showing up. Typically, when you start seeing uh, some of those later uh, weapons appearing... It's usually a good time to just double check and uh, see if these other recipes are here. There's a lot more recipe books than this. Um, primarily, you'll be getting those from Palace of the Dead, uh, basically scattered all around uh, the bottom 25 floors of the dungeon, as well as the final bosses of the uh, Elemental Temples. Um, and also, for whatever reason, uh, the Elemental Chokers are off by themselves in San Bronza on, I believe it was floor either 4 or 14, something with a 4 in it. It doesn't particularly matter, the drop rates are unbelievably low anyway, but uh, let's get into it here. What should you be focusing on when you're going and doing your crafting? Well, let's address the obvious elephant in the room first. Usually, you're only picking which things you want to craft due to limited resources, and for most of the basic upgrades, that limited resource is going to be money. So, uh, anything that you can buy from the store, you'll be able to get from the store. Um, with a couple of exceptions, uh, namely that uh, if you go to other stores, there's two other store types in the game, if you go to those you may not necessarily be able to craft things, just to kind of throw that out there, uh, simply because they may not have the materials in stock to be able to do so. Uh, so, for example, if you wanted to make a blowgun, um, and you happen to be in a Palace of the Dead shop or Deneb's shop, they do not sell weapons there, so they would not have a blowgun to craft into, you know, a different blowgun. But just to kind of throw that out there, if your crafting isn't working and you're in the later game, that could be why. But uh, the elephant in the room here is the infinite uh, money exploit. Uh, basically, for whatever reason, um, the devs said it was a uh, Christmas uh, joke or something along those lines, but uh, apparently almost everything in the blowgun category uh, is going to give you a profit if you make it. Um, so, you know, abuse that if you will. But uh, the purpose of today's guide will be to cover if you're uh, kind of playing it straight, playing it legit, sticking with the in-game economy. Um, what should you be prioritizing in terms of your upgrades? So, there's a few upgrades that uh, are going to stick out among the rest, um, but just so you know, pretty much every upgrade, with some minor exceptions, is, is going to be a fairly direct upgrade. Usually, most of the standard ones are going to be fairly cheap. So, for example, uh, something like, you know, leather sleeves or gauntlets, you probably already have a fair bit of leather laying around when you get these. You probably get a fair bit of, uh, you know, uh, bronze bars and things. Those are going to be fairly cheap to upgrade. We're talking about maybe a couple hundred bucks for a pair of gloves or something along those lines. Generally speaking, um, when it comes to upgrades, you should usually be prioritizing the stuff that'll give you some added effects. The actual statistical benefit uh, behind these different items will not be that gigantic. There's exceptions, sure, but they're usually not going to be that big of a deal. So, for example, the difference between these uh, cat claws over here is 16 attack, 2% uh, scaling attack, 1 extra weight, 2 extra recovery time when swinging, um, 5 extra damage versus beasts, but the big one would be something like getting poison on there. There's not many additional effect items, but just so you know, so we're absolutely clear, um, the actual benefits that they're giving you in terms of attack and defense are not going to be the main thing that you're buying them for. So, first and foremost, the, uh, the biggest one to upgrade early on is going to be your handguards. Uh, reason for this is because they will come with a jump uh, effect on there. Now, it says jump one. The final ones that you get at the very end are going to be giving you jump two. Don't worry, these are so far into the game that uh, realistically, even by the time you get there, as you can tell, this is a several hundred hour play file, and I still only can make another one of these. <laughs> um, but either way, um, 
for the most part, these are going to be increasing your jump by one. Now, this doesn't seem like much, but the actual uh, difference between uh, no jump and jump one is actually going to be enough to get you on top of rooftops, and in many cases over many different obstacles. Uh, this is one of those skills that kind of flew under the radar in the PSP version, because you look at jump one and you think one extra tile of movement, that's not going to matter much, but it's conveniently about the exact height of a lot of rooftops. Um, so. In most cases, most characters will already have two or three jumps, so this will be your biggest initial boost in uh, mobility. And you may have potentially seen the upgrade right next to them and thought, wait a minute, why isn't Swift Foot more important? Well, the thing is, with jump, you're essentially getting a new type of movement available to you. Um, but the second most important one for some characters is going to be over here in the leg guards, and these are pretty much universally going to be giving you Swift Foot. Now, Sure, there are other things in here as well, but uh, again, this is going to be the main thing that you're looking for. So Swift Foot will increase your movement range by one, but please bear in mind that this doesn't mean that you should always be taking your maximum movement range. In fact, you should be trying to move as little as possible for most of your characters. Generally speaking, the uh, if, you're, if you're early on, the main thing that I would recommend upgrading are going to be the ones for your casters and for your archers and for your more nimble units. Uh, for your heavies, you're going to get barely a bonus out of this. They're going to be a decent bit more expensive. Like the chain leggings are a fine, cheap upgrade. Um, but generally speaking, aside from these uh, these top three, maybe hold off on, for example, these two as they come up, because there will be a dramatic increase in cost. Uh, that you may potentially be far better off uh, spending on stuff like uh, debuff items, um, rather than uh, going and burning all your money on something as expensive as Boulder. Um, either way. Um, as far as all this stuff is concerned, yeah, generally speaking, these top three are the main ones that you're going to be going for, reason being that if you have a character that has, for example, three movement, that additional tile of movement is, again, about 33% increase, 33% uh, of an increase in range. That is going to be uh, pretty huge in terms of them being able to avoid things. Bear in mind, early on, the AI usually will not get these upgrades, so you're suddenly going to be able to match the movement range of most standard melee units, uh, with your casters. This gives them a lot more of uh, kind of an option to escape. That being said, um, bear in mind that uh, the gloves do that job a decent bit better because they might be able to, to for example, take a one tile movement on top of a roof instead of, you know, trying to take that extra tile of lateral movement to escape. So it's nice in some situations, but you usually don't want to be taking these big dramatic moves on units that's, well, it, on most units, frankly. There, there's not actually as big of a uh, need for swift foot as it may initially seem all right next up is kind of an interesting one uh, your body slot uh, will give you uh, will give you access to wade so wade is a is essentially the ability to move in water at the cost of one movement um, and it only actually subtracts that movement when you go into the water itself the interesting thing here though is that uh, by the way the reason that I clarify this, Siege also is worded the same way, but it actually functions differently. So, like, Siege will take away your ability to move one tile full stop, um, but then give you the ability to ignore Rampart Aura. Wade will only deduct one extra tile if moving through, uh, uh, through water, but it does unlock the ability to walk into water tiles. I will say, generally speaking, I would not recommend, uh, especially early on, I would not recommend upgrading your, uh, your body armor, except for... Um, um, except for units that are specifically looking to hide in the water. The reason for this is a quirk of the game wherein if you're unable to walk into the tile, you also can't be knocked into that kind of tile. So, for example, if you happen to be in, in like, let's say, a map like the, uh, 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 like the, uh, the sewers and whatnot, and you happen to have somebody that's standing in an area surrounded by water, but they're comfortably sitting, you know, on that pillar in the middle of the water, they're suddenly unmovable. They, nobody can move them out of that spot. If you give them Wade, they, you know, sure, they can walk through the water, but if they get knocked off a platform into the water, they are now stuck there. So it, this is going to be a bit more situational, but just bear in mind that you don't always want to have uh, your upgraded armor on hand, and you may potentially want to take Wade off. It's as much of a potential, you know, cheesable, you know, overpowered ability in some cases as much as it is a liability in completely others. So... Bear in mind and uh, bear that in mind and think about what your needs of a team actually are. All right, next up we got the helmets. These are an odd one uh, because these are, I would say, probably the least important expense, um, with one exception, and that is going to be the circlet. 
So with most of these, the actual benefit that you're getting is a very, very minor increase. Like in the case of the Bronze Helm, for example, it gives you about, I think it's like one extra percent uh, crush resistance, one extra percent slash resistance, and two defense. That is negligible by any standard. Now, the reason I mention this in particular is because this item used to be a particular favorite in the PSP version where it had 8% uh, universal resistance against everything when it was crafted, which was a little bit broken under the right circumstances. This time around, uh, the circlet did actually manage to keep those resistances. Um, so this is going to give you 8% elemental resistance against, well, all element types, as well as 2% uh, resistance regardless of your damage profile. Um, now, this is particularly handy because most classes are able to use the circlet, and it's more or less uh, easy to think about this thing as a mind shield, um, that uh, if you have anybody that's getting bullied by casters, just give them a circlet. It, it, like, especially for uh, for units like archers, for ninjas, um, just units in general that may be out on their own, may be farther away from support, uh, having that additional 8% uh, resistance is going to be pretty meaningful for them. Uh, it might be the difference uh, between, you know, them potentially getting carved down before or they actually can get back close, or it might be enough to uh, make them survive and, you know, take that extra hit as they're running away. So just something to bear in mind, it's a cheap and very, very effective upgrade. Um, whereas, uh, for example, uh, most of the helmets aren't really that, like, they're actually fairly expensive for the very minor bonuses that they're giving you. Um, later on, when you get into the actual crafted helmets, uh, it's probably worth paying attention to uh, something like this right here. So. This isn't something that you're going to run into in the early game, but just so you're aware, uh, when it comes to the worm scale gear, uh, and basically anything that has a dragon bonus, if you equip three pieces of that, um, it will give you the ability to equip Dragon Slayer on that unit. Um, so if you're coming from the PSP version and you're wondering why you didn't automatically get Dragon Slayer, you know, you just, you have to equip it this time around. Um, now that being said, um, as far as that equipment goes, generally speaking, I probably still wouldn't advise actually crafting it because you can usually end up just finding it uh, off of enemy units faster than uh, you can actually acquire things like worm whiskers, which are fairly rare. But either way, just something to consider. Um, another thing, actually, before we go uh, farther here, uh, I mentioned uh, damage profile earlier. So whether it was intentional or a bug, um, whether it was a mistranslation or, you know, a misaligned... Uh, you know, let's say resistance somewhere. Um, the way that defense works in this one may be a little counterintuitive for one of the categories. So racial resistances are exactly what they say. It's just a percentage resistance against whatever you run into. Elemental stuff is a bit more situational because the element will essentially boost your affinity in that direction. Now, this isn't like a score that's tallied up and, you know, put into the UI somewhere. It's basically like this robe of dust, for example, is not for earth units. Uh, this would essentially be for water units, uh, paradoxically, um, because essentially because they're wearing a kind of earth imbued uh, cloak kind of thing. It's giving them 10% lightning resistance because it's affiliated with earth. It's essentially just that element defeating the other element. So in many cases, equipping the element that is strong against the thing that that unit is weak against is going to be your best actual uh, option. So just bear that in mind uh, when it comes to stuff like, for example, these robes over here, that, uh, that is kind of the way that it's going to be working. Um, additionally, I mentioned, I, I mentioned uh, attack profile, though. Uh, so this isn't an official term, it's just how I mentally like to categorize it. But if you look at those three numbers at the top, the, uh, the crush, slash, and piercing. So these are not exactly direct resistances like you'd think they would be. And it's arguable, again, whether this was intentional or whatever else. But as it currently stands, um, if you are, uh, whether you're hit by a, like for example, whether you're hit by a hammer, a sword, or a spear, this unit would still only be using one of those values, and that would be the value of their right-hand weapon. So the default is crushing because that is your fist, but for example, if you equip a sword, you would get 3% slashing resistance. If you equip a spear, you would have 4% uh, pierce resistance, um, and if you equip a hammer, you get 1% crush resistance. So effectively, you can look at that as kind of the, 
I guess, kind of tailored profile of, of the equipment in question. So, for example, a Pierce unit might get a bit more out of using something like this. It's a very minor thing. It really only matters if you're really min-maxing stuff. But just bear that in mind that in some cases, if you see, you know, some long-term players maybe uh, equipping some really weirdly mismatched gear, uh, like, uh, you know, if you see somebody running around, like, just equipping a bunch of armor that seems like it wouldn't match otherwise. Uh, just know that that is, in terms of min-maxing, if you're looking to get the most out of your armor, tailoring it towards that unit's particular uh, uh, edge type is actually fairly effective. Uh, so, for example, you can usually get that up to like 10-15% to 15 physical resistance. Bear in mind, again, this applies to all physical types. So, if the unit's using a sword when using this one, regardless of whether they, they were being hit by a hammer or a spear, they would still only get 1% resistance because that is what their personal weapon is giving them in terms of defense. Again, maybe it's mistranslation, maybe it's a bug, I don't know, I don't care, that's how it works right now. Um, so. Hey, so just a quick side note here on the armor profile thing. Uh, there was an interesting insight uh, from uh, Rakes, uh, the uh, developer of the uh, One Vision mod the other day, um, that uh, it's possible that whatever is going on with, you know, what we're going to go ahead and call the armor profile system here, uh, might be related to what happened with Anatomy back in the PSP version. Uh, so those that never uh, played that one, basically Anatomy was a skill that gave you uh, both uh, penetration and armor versus uh, human units uh, while equipped and would rank up as as it was used. Now, there was a uh, bug in that one in which it would basically universally check uh, for the, uh, the defender's uh, uh, kind of a status rather than the attacker's status. So for example, it would, like let's say a lizard was attacking somebody, it would be like, okay, lizard attacks human. Does human have herpetology? If herpetology is yes, then, you know, add like plus four armor for each rank of herpetology and then scale down off armor. Basically, it just goes into the whole calculation mill, so to speak. Um, but in the case of anatomy, it basically was considered one of the most overpowered skills in the game because it would just give you universal defense against everything. So there was basically no reason to not use anatomy. Now, interestingly enough, that is more or less what happens with the profile here. Uh, that uh, when it's attacking, instead of being like, well, the attacker is hitting me with a sword, I'm going to resist 3% of the sword damage. Instead, it becomes, uh, you know, I am using a sword. Therefore, I will use the sword physical defense. Now, again, this isn't major. Realistically, in most cases, you're looking at like 2-3% to of a damage difference. Um, there's This is literally just a thing that matters for like challenge runners and people ultra min-maxing in like several hundred hours into the game. Um, and even then, like personally, I was kind of bugged by this at first. And then once I started realizing that, hey, you can actually cheese the hell out of this... I kind of started loving it, and I'm almost hoping that they don't fix it, but e either way, like, everyone's going to have their own opinions on this. I just thought I'd throw it out there, because um, it's always interesting to see Rakes' knowledge on this stuff, because he's probably more intimately familiar with the uh, the internals of the game than anyone, um, because, again, the PSP version and this one share a lot of DNA. It's basically the same engine, the same game, reworked in a bunch of different ways. Um, anyway, back to it. Just, uh, to, just to bear that in mind, because if you think about it, if you get it up to, let's say, 10% resistance, but the actual defense bonus that uh, you're getting off of, let's say, moving up to a different armor is only 5 hard defense, that hard defense would shave 5 damage off in most situations, uh, whereas, for example, that 10% is whatever 10% of the incoming hit was, um, that it could potentially mean a lot more defense. So. Either way, everything is going to vary. There is no simple, like, this is always better in this, you know, in every situation kind of deal. Um, but just uh, kind of something to bear in mind. Okay. Next up, as far as shields go, uh, this is actually probably the biggest thing in terms of those uh, damage profiles that I mentioned earlier, uh, because different shields are going to be uh, giving you dramatically more defense in particular directions. Uh, early on, it's primarily that way, like the buckler is a good kind of universal shield for everybody. Um, same thing with the pelta, and then once the SP starts coming in, they start going better towards crush, and then the tower shield is better against slash. Um, better crush on the spike shield again, balder shield is another kind of uh, elemental resistance shield this time around. Uh, heater continues going down that particular path. Um, as they go on, the shields actually start giving you more and more resistances uh, to all kinds of different things until you get something like the Medusa shield, um, which, by the way, does not take an Aegis to actually craft this time around. 
Um, but by that point, uh, they're giving you fairly solid universal resistance against casters and things like that. Uh, either darn way. As far as shields go, yeah, generally you're just going to be tailoring them towards that particular defense type because the actual defense number, as you can tell over there, is barely going up at all over the course of the game. Like this right here would be chapter one. This right here would be most of chapter two. This would mostly be chapter three. And then over here we got mostly chapter four. We have managed to move that defense score up by 11. Um, anyway. So there's that, and then as far as the jewelry, just kind of whatever stat you prefer is going to be what you end up preferring. Uh, later on, you have, thing, you have access to uh, things like uh, weapon skill bonuses, which will increase your ability to do damage with uh, shots, uh, if you happen to be running a build that is uh, using shots. Um, that being said, uh, the, these are fairly self-explanatory. Uh, though kind of a minor thing to bear in mind is that if you are looking to min-max uh, physical uh, kind of uh, resistances, the uh, uh, the basic warrior and defender rings are actually going to give you better physical resistance uh, than any of the other stat boosting rings. It's not necessarily always going to be that big of a deal, but in some cases it might be what you're looking for. Alright, now let's go to the one that you actually probably came here for, which is the weapons. Which ones should you be focusing on? All right, first off in the claws, realistically, if you have, uh, as with everything else, if you have the stuff on hand, you might as well go for uh, for some basic upgrades. If you don't, don't bother buying them. Like, if, uh, if it isn't practically free, don't bother going for it. Um, but what I was talking about earlier with that uh, armor customization thing is stuff like this right here, where there's certain cases where certain weapons will be switching to uh, different uh, damage types. Meaning that in some specific situations, it actually might be worth uh, sticking with a uh, kind of lower power weapon in order to get more of your uh, more out of your armor. I know this seems like a weird thing to uh, to potentially attempt, but your actual difference in kind of damage being dealt is not going to be that significant. However, uh, the difference in uh, defense uh, versus physical things is going to be fairly noticeable. Um, Again, you know, see all of that as you will. It's just kind of interesting that it works that way. But as far as claws go, the biggest uh, upgrade that you're going to get is going to be uh, something like the uh, the pe uh, cat bachna uh, with a uh, poison effect on there. Um, again, poison is 10% of health three times per turn, give or take. So essentially, you're guaranteeing that that guy's going to die in four turns. Um, but uh, you can also guarantee this. It's actually one of only a couple ways that you can guarantee poison on something, um, on uh, something like a warrior. So, for example, uh, give them vigorous attack. They, they will automatically guarantee uh, the poison on their next uh, hit, um, and this will uh, ignore parries and things like that. Um, additionally, this has an upgraded version with the, uh, the tiger uh, up here a few claws later. And again, you have a few more uh, different uh, variants over here if you would prefer, but... Uh, Generally speaking, I would say stick with the uh, with the poison claws. I know they were good for me up until uh, you know the post game and all that. Um, generally speaking, even the uh, like the god weapons and things like that for the fists never seem to match the damage output of the poison claws. But you know, your mileage may vary. Um, something like the Damask Claws uh, introduces us to our first uh, rule here when it comes to Damascus weapons, in that if you've ever seen Damascus metal, it is quite stunning. And fittingly, when you end up upgrading them, you get a stun effect on there. Um, so this will obviously guarantee stun if you have any way to guarantee it. Um, however, it's just quite frankly inferior to the uh, the tiger claws in pretty much every way um not only are not only do they weigh more they take longer to swing um but they also will give you stun instead of poison and as good as stun may be there's a lot of ways to mass inflict stun but mass inflicting poison not so much anyway uh, next up we have dragon claws and dragon blades both of them will work for creating the dragon slayer set on a warrior uh, or a berserker if you should so, uh, if you should so choose and you don't feel like using a uh, you know a dragoon additionally uh, we start seeing uh, items around this point uh, starting to give you a, a missile ability on there I wouldn't expect too much out of it it's really more of a just way for a melee unit to finish off somebody at long range but it's a nice little bonus um, additionally, uh, once we start getting into the elemental variants, uh, that's when you can start kind of uh, splitting your coverage in terms of uh, your different upgrades. 
But again, for the most part, regardless of uh, coverages or whatever else, I've generally found that pretty much none of the upgrades on these mattered nearly as much as uh, as the Tiger Claws. Like, I've tried everything on this list, and there was nothing that was doing as much as the Tiger Claws. They will, generally speaking, still be doing more or less the same amount of damage for the most part. There are edge cases, there are situations where you'll be, you know, taking advantage of elemental weaknesses and things, but just poison is way too good. Um, anyway, moving on. Uh, for the daggers, you have a silence effect over here on the Dark Plus One, um, and aside from that, you have the stun on the Damask Dagger. Not a whole lot aside from basic damage upgrades, it's just daggers don't really boost your overall damage that much. Um, however, this can be useful for finisher spammers. So these, these are mostly going to be cases where you're going to be uh, uh, using them primarily for the finisher. Uh, so, um, by the way, interesting uh, note on this is that uh, certain characters will actually be able to equip uh, different types of daggers. So, for example, if you ever saw the um, uh, the thing on the Chris here where it says that uh, it's a favored weapon of mages, wondered why you couldn't use it on your standard mages, it's because you got to use it on your weird mages. So your familiars and your patriarchs and stuff in the later game uh, will be able to use these daggers. Um, and, uh, for example, something like uh, the Dirt Plus One with its silencing effect can be used by the ninja, though not all the daggers can be. But generally speaking, you've got your basic ones, so your your uh, sticker, your balder, and your damask. Uh, that's something that almost anyone can use. You've got your sort of fighting variants, so you're like your battle knife, your butcher knife, uh, your kidney spike. Uh, those are for the more fighting oriented classes. And then you have a few kind of uh, edge cases uh, for all kinds of different other knives here. But generally speaking, most of them are going to be fighting knives. Um, personally, I saw it as a, kind of an, um, an important thing to uh, upgrade the uh, the sticker. Um, the balder was pretty good for spellcasters because of that additional intelligence bonus. Uh, Dirk was great uh, in terms of uh, having something like, for example, uh, a, a Varton with a, a finisher spammer. Um, just a nice lightweight weapon that uh, gives them a chance to silence things while still giving a decent amount of punch. But generally speaking, um, I usually ended up going uh, Dirk uh, into Damask and then into Dragonfang. So as nice as these other elemental bonuses are, again, poison just too good. Um, and additionally, gives you the ability to cast poison. So especially if you happen to be having this on a Patriarch, it's going to be fairly devastating. Uh, so the Dragonfang is available uh, pretty much at the same time as most of these other daggers. You can get it uh, doing the elemental temples. Generally, I'm going to assume that if somebody's like aware of the elemental temples, they're probably already going and clearing all of them at least once. So I would assume that all of these are going to come as a package deal. Uh, that's why I'm not going into specifics over which one comes from exactly where, because usually you want to do all of them if you're doing them at all. But anyway, um, so yeah, Dragonfang, pretty, uh, pretty good on its own. However, don't equip this on an Earth unit, as odd as that sounds. Uh, the additional 15% uh, bonus is fantastic for essentially covering a weakness that the unit wouldn't otherwise have. Again, remember that uh, if you are matching your element, it's about a 10% bonus. But if you are attacking the uh, an element uh, that's opposed to it, uh, then you will, could potentially be doing dramatically more. Uh, so, for example, if this thing were to be used on a, a lightning unit, so I would get an additional 15% damage as opposed to your 10% damage from uh, using it on an earth unit. Either way, it also carves through dragons, because 20% extra damage versus dragons. But uh, that poison effect on this thing is incredibly likely to hit, even without the ability to guarantee. Um, like I said, personally, I preferred having these on Patriarchs. Uh, just simply put, uh, they seem to hit about 80% of the time with poison. I don't know why the odds are so high, but uh, seems very consistent. So go ahead and give that a bit of a shot. Uh, next up, we have Swords. Generally, would not recommend upgrading the smaller ones here. They're a decent bump in power, but realistically, like, it, you might as well just use the weapon by itself. Like, there's no reason that you should be upgrading only these two. Um, unless, of course, there's something I'm missing. I mean, if you have the materials, it, they're fairly cheap. But for most cases, you probably won't need that much out of these weapons. However, the rapier is actually a pretty solid choice uh, for something like a defensively orientated uh, warrior build or even a knight. Um, just false strike doesn't seem like much uh, given how, you know, how high everything's accuracy is. But 20% on a boss, on a debuff that can't be resisted by anything in the game is enormous. So a vigorous attack plus a rapier on a warrior. Uh, this actually applies to the cutlass as well. It's another one that gets a later game variant. Um, 
using that on a boss is going to be incredible uh, because many of the times, uh, like for example, especially if you have uh, kind of stacked bosses later on in the game, spreading around false strike uh, is 20% chance for them to completely miss their move and that can be absolutely game changing when it lands. I Just to avoid frustrations, I would not recommend just sitting there you know, praying that they will miss their finisher over and over, but this is a great one to just spread around and watch the results trickle in. You also have uh, something like the Damask over here with a stun effect. Personally, I found these really reliable in the hands of a uh, dual-wielding buccaneer. Uh, but again, you know, basically can just use them on anything. Uh, One-handed swords are uh, universally going to uh, be the parry variant. Um, usually, um, I would say that these are actually worth uh, sticking with an elemental weakness on uh, once you get later in the game, though. Um, again, just keep your false strike swords around. They could potentially be useful. Uh, but generally, sword users tend to be on the more defensive side, so any additional push they can get, they would probably appreciate. Especially if, once again, you're just using their second finisher to just draw poison on things. You may see a running theme at this point. Alright, so then we get into the two-handers. Um, these other upgrades are nice, but there's Wayhander and Claymore. Those are <laughs> you're going to be the two that you want to stick with, especially on a Terra Knight. Without any bias whatsoever. Let me just say that uh, Zwei or Claymore on a Terranite um, with uh, with Terrifying Impact is bar none the best can opener in the game, no questions asked. Um, to give you an idea of mechanically what's going on, because the damage from in this game is fairly complicated, um, they will essentially guarantee the breach because Fearful Impact has a 100% chance to hit, uh, which means that both effects will be guaranteed to land. They'll hit with Fear, they'll hit with Breach. Fear will lower all stats of the unit by 15% across the board, um, including uh, all thresholds from gear, um, and additionally will, uh, will inflict Breach, which will multiply incoming damage by 50%. Basically, if something is hit by that, the next thing that hits them will hit them like a meteor. Um, it is like I said, the best can opener in the game. Now, that being said, if you're attacking a boss, something like Breach will still be able to hit them. Breach is unresistible by anything. Um, so there's certain debuffs that are always going to be handy no matter what. So Breach, Stun, Fall Strike, um, these are all kind of considered minor debuffs that uh, that bosses cannot resist. Uh, something like, a, like, for example, a Charm or Curse or Petrify, they can. Um, either way. Uh, same rule though over here if you want a, a stunning two-hander and then you got the usual elemental variants that come in after that but honestly if you have a two-hander user claymore or Zway, good all game don't even worry about it um axes uh they get access to misstep uh that's not gonna be useful um like even in challenge run scenarios like i've i've been running cases of severely under leveled parties and even in cases where like theoretically it might be handy where your accuracy is dropping to the low 70s you know it's in the rain so it's dropping to the low 50s um even then it's just you, there's no reason that you're going to be trying to inflict misstep on anything so axes are one of those ones where if you need that extra bit of power go for it uh damask axe is probably the best universal one of the crafted variants um and then you got your elemental variants down over here usually axes are going to be Kind of more dancing around their finishers and uh, their pretty fantastic coverage. Um, they've got good speed and coverage on their finishers, so generally I would say stick with one element uh, for taking advantage of that element. Get a axe of a different element to cover that weakness, and then attempt to kind of synergize that with the uh, uh, with the uh, ice and earth that you already have available. So generally speaking, something like the uh, Stardust actually does make sense right here up at the very end. Uh, being able to, for example, um, uh, take advantage of uh, dark units uh, while still uh, while still having uh, coverage in terms of like covering air through ice as well as uh, covering lightning through uh, their earth finisher um, while still having access to a multi-hit. Um, again, there. this is one that's primarily just for power. All right, next we get Spears, my personal favorite, because they get access to all the best stuff. Uh, so Volge plus one, honestly, I was using this straight up into the hardest fight into the game. Um, in my mind, probably one of the best weapons there is. Two tiles uh, and can be used by Lord with Fearful Impact to guarantee a double breach, double fear. <laughs> Um, it's hilarious. Uh, same thing with the uh, scorpion. You can go fear poison. You can become the scarecrow with a stick. Um, and there's also the Damask Spear. That's uh, honestly everything down here. There's niche cases, sure. 
Like, for example, if you have a primarily caster-related unit, like, for example, something like a... Uh, uh, I haven't been able to confirm exactly how this works, to be completely honest, but, for example, if you have something like a uh, Valkyrie, um, and they were to be, you know, using uh, magic of some particular element, supposedly it adds this percentage of extra damage, regardless of element type, uh, to that particular spell. Now, I don't exactly know how all that works, but generally speaking, I would say stick to the Volge, stick to the Scorpion, and if you really want to get long-range stun, then you can always use the Damask Spear, but realistically, those two are nice, cheap upgrades that'll do the job just absolutely fantastically. Alright, next up we got your Hammers. Um, if you have access to Enchanted Feathers, you already have access to Kaldias more than likely, so you probably will never need to make this, but... Um, generally, you want to keep a large stack of Kaldias on hand. They are, in many cases, while there aren't that many of what I would call best-in-slot type items, generally speaking, a Kaldia is going to be one of the best items for casters to have. Because if they're already boosting intelligence, they're probably also boosting mind, meaning that uh, the secondary ability over here for the ability to charm is going to be more significant in their hands, giving them a sort of kind of off-MP action to take. The reason that this is important um, is because in many cases, casters will end up burning out, and I see folks get frustrated trying to find ways to make infinite MP items and whatever else, but really it's as simple as just keeping cheaper stuff on hand. You really don't want to be using your expensive stuff all the time, and a Kaldi is a nice uh, synergy into that. Uh, so, for example, I like to keep uh, stuff like Poison Mist or uh, Paralytic Wave on hand because they're good, they're cheap, and usually you'll have, like 90% of the time, you'll have MP left over, from using your stronger hitting moves to go for something like that, and something like Poison Cloud will usually end up doing more anyway. So in many cases, you can continue pressuring with something very cheap. Um, but if they ever do burn out, usually I've never found myself needing more than one Kaldia charge to go essentially take that turn as just a free cast on something. Now, this wouldn't really apply for something like, let's say, a Valkyrie, which will be running around with more or less infinite MP anyway, but just something to consider, uh, since this also comes with a parry chance. Now, that being said, um, if you want uh, to have uh, something like an Iron Fan on there as well, these actually do hit reasonably hard. Uh, they are classed as a hammer. They've got some very good offense on them. Um, they're actually like 64 here, so that is roughly... I mean, that that's actually dramatically more than it was last time, I gotta say. It's funny, in the PSP version, the, uh, the Iron Fan was actually bizarrely like a friggin' early uh, Chapter 4 kind of uh, weapon stats-wise. Um, this time around, it's actually a bit more reasonable, but still, 5% uh, people uh, uh, scaling damage, that's uh, that's pretty solid. Um, but if you don't think you're going to need a um, uh, need that charm cast, and you want to have something that can hit reasonably hard on a caster, or at least some casters, uh, bear in mind not all of them can use it, as you can see here. Uh, so, for example, uh, if you wanted to have a ninja using that, it would still work for them. If you wanted to have a Vartan use it, it uh, could be useful for them. Actually, for Vartan in particular, it could be an interesting uh, type coverage situation. But either way, it's a nice little uh, parry weapon for them. It's actually one of the, I guess, one of the more fitting parry weapons for something like a uh, Terror Knight. Um, so might potentially consider using that as a uh, as a shield of sorts um, for uh, for a Terror Knight, but. Anyway, uh, th this is actually a nice way to guarantee stun plus fear uh, on them as well. Uh, so, yeah, Terra Knight, Iron Fan, not a bad combination. Uh, just something to consider, but they all they are, I mean, considering the uh, the Kaldia up here, it might be a little expensive to get a hold of. That being said, as far as other hammers go, generally speaking, the hammers are going to be fine on their own. Uh, something like the Damask Hammer is fantastic in an AoE. Um, but by and large, again, this is another one that you're primarily upgrading for power, though I gotta say, I've usually found myself just preferring the default hammers, uh, since a lot of them take a lot of animal parts to make, and a lot of those animal parts are better off spent on other things. Anyway, 1HKs, as soon as you get them, you might as well upgrade them. Uh, they need all the help they can get, uh, they're kind of in the suffering category this time around. Um, either way, uh, they're nice and lightweight, uh, they do technically okay damage for their weight and also later on you can kind of uh, mix and match different uh, sword types for different coverages um though i will say I, I personally found myself not really wanting to invest in these particular ones very much uh, just because they are all relatively on the expensive side to actually upgrade and usually uh, the standard uh standard short bow plus one uh on the ninja was the only thing i ever wanted on them more on that in a moment 
uh, two HKs, you might as well upgrade if you're using a Swordmaster at some point. Again, going to be fairly expensive on the upgrade side. You're not going to see a gigantic return, but again, they have one weapon type. They need all the help they can get, so you might as well. Um, I would prioritize ones like, for example, Mageblade over here or the uh, uh, Nadachi. Just anything that gives them a vitality or resistance bonus is going to be fairly uh, uh, fairly big for them. Um, Oakblade uh, is actually pretty good. Um, these two right here are just a solid uh, resistance and vitality bonus. Again, they need all the defensive help they can get. Um, Kudra wise, uh, usually not a whole lot of point to upgrade these earlier ones, especially something like the, uh, the mage staff here is interesting because it does technically give you a, like a chunk of extra range, but the items needed to get it are unusually rare. Now that being said, mage staff is already going to be giving you a fantastic return with that uh, plus three range. It doesn't last for very long though, because it's almost immediately replaced by the, uh, the restoration and purification staffs. Those are 100% something you should be using, especially the purification ones. Not everybody can use these, but uh, they're pretty much going to be the best uh, stabs that uh, that are in the game, more or less. Um, you can get a little bit more min-maxed with it with these elemental variants. Bear in mind that they don't actually care which element that you're using. So the different uh, flavor types are just, you know, just that flavor. Uh, which is why in most cases I would recommend uh, sticking with a purification staff because not everybody has access to uh, something like an exorcism and this is a nice little way to have that. Sure, you end up giving up on two resistance, one mind, and two intelligence, but honestly, who cares? Um, okay, next up, whips. If you're using whips, just you might as well upgrade them. There's, these are going to be so niche that I doubt that there's any question as to whether or not you should. Um, uh, for most of the game, you're just going to have access to these ones anyway, which are just going to be a direct attack upgrade. Uh, books, you wouldn't recommend investing in. Uh, these are just something that you make, more so than something that you find. They give you a good amount of uh, kind of anti-racial damage against one particular thing. Other than that, they have identical stats, and they give you plus three range. It's very oddly specific. Moving on. Um, next up for instruments. Um, I mean... You're slightly upgrading something that's already there. And by this point, I really doubt that uh, anyone's going to care about uh, materials this basic, so you might as well. Um, okay, next up, we already mentioned earlier, blowguns. These are basically your free money printer. Uh, so, you know, for example, if we were to uh, go ahead and make a bunch of these, it costs us 1.2 mil uh, to uh, make a stack of them. And then we can immediately go over here to uh, sell them. And where do we have them here? <laughs> take these and now we can sell them for 3.2 mil so either way uh, if you want to have your uh, kind of a runescape merching experience there you go uh, now that being said let's go ahead and cover the actual interesting stuff uh, so first of all uh, bows short bow plus one just make a stack of these right away they are a very cheap upgrade and by far if you ask me the best weapon for ninjas in the entire game Reason being, uh, they have a chance to stun, and they weigh practically nothing. Um, these, this is the lightest weight bow in the game, so if you're looking for any situation uh, where you need something to have an offhand shooting thing to throw some additional effect for one reason or another, again, especially ninjas with their poison arrows, this is going to be just ginormous for them. Um, so, definitely worth uh, keeping on hand, like for example, an iron fan uh, plus a um, uh, plus a short bow plus one is a nice, lightweight, uh, very versatile build uh, for a ninja in particular. Essentially gives them the ability to uh, to stun in one hand, gives them the ability to poison and stun on the other hand. They put an inst a, uh, instill silence on their uh, spell list. Suddenly they're able to, uh, to essentially switch between uh, poison, uh, stun, and... Um, uh, and silence on the fly. Um, just an absolutely fantastic thing to have. So I just kind of noticed this when uh, editing later, but I completely forgot to mention the compound bows, uh, basically the three elemental bows at the bottom of the crafting list. Uh, basically those uh, allow you to equip counter three on basically anyone that can use a bow, which is pretty gigantic for skirmisher builds in the late game. Uh, just kind of uh, throwing that out there. Uh, their elemental bonuses might not be as gigantic as some of the other ones, but uh, just the uh, counter three on basically any wep uh, melee weapon that you want is pretty awesome. Though you can use it to some hilarious effects to uh, do some weird stuff like, for example, staff plus short bow and just kind of counter bonk stuff on the head. Is it practical? No, but it is funny. Anyway. But, uh, but yeah, very lightweight, very quick to fire. 
Uh, for comparison right here, upgrading from to the great bow from the short bow is a plus seven RT increase um, in your uh, uh, in your actual firing speed, and this continues to go up. By the time you get to a siege bow, it is uh, nearly double uh, the time to actually fire. Um, so just kind of something to bear in mind. Uh, just the uh, the short bows in general are dramatically quicker to fire. Uh, later on, you get the Damask Bow, which is technically an upgrade power-wise, but realistically speaking, the attack bonus, sure, the technical attack bonus might be about double, but that extra 50% of weight is, honestly, I would argue, like, you don't really need that extra attack power. You're, if you're hitting slightly more, uh, I mean, it, finishers won't really require this. If you're running something like a Spellcaster Poison Arrow build, the attack value is completely irrelevant and you're just giving up speed. So, either way, uh, cheap and effective, definitely short bows. Uh, for your regular archers, upgrading their longbow is usually going to be, again, cheap and effective. Usually it's just metal and something you already have on hand. Great bows are bizarrely the cheapest, or not the cheapest, but the uh, the most difficult one to upgrade because you need a beast horn for that. Um, so, if you're going into Chapter 2, you wondered why you didn't have great bows, you probably, I, I believe you actually get beast horns from killing that dragon uh, in, the, uh, in Chapter 1. Um, so I believe that might be a little bit of a bonus there. Either way, um, archers need all the attack bonus that they can get, uh, seeing as uh, they will end up uh, scaling dramatically higher if they manage to win the attack calculation. Uh, for those that missed the calculations video, by the way, um, essentially ranged weapons and melee weapons do function differently. It's so, like melee weapons are directly like attack and defense values go, go against each other, scaling happens, and then you get your damage result. Um, in the case of ranged weapons, they will scale up the damage of the ranged attack by 2.5, but also scale up enemy armor by 2.5. Um, essentially meaning that uh, if you manage to bypass armor, you will scale two and a half times higher than a melee weapon, but if you don't, you'll end up uh, getting dramatically less damage. So, for example, attacking um, attacking opposing elements, uh, things like uh, switching out your bows, like for example, later on, you get options like this where you can, for example, have effective uh, kind of four-way effective damage off your uh, off of most uh, archer units, basically personal element, weapon element, and then the two finisher elements. Um, so depending on your situation, these can kind of vary fairly wildly. Um, but as far as basic longbows go, generally you're looking more for range. Um, so for example, sticking with the longbow over the composite bow is absolutely understandable. Um, generally, you don't want to have your archers doing something like a short bow, though I will say... Uh, something like a, a like basic short bow as well as a, a dagger actually does work out pretty nicely finisher wise. They complement each other pretty darn well. So if you want a very very fast archer that's very good with finishers, a dagger short bow might actually do it for you. Um, something like the mask would do that job a little bit better. Um, again, it, it costs a decent bit more to fire, but they actually could use the attack value in that case. Um, but just bear in mind that these weapons are all about scaling and sometimes require a little bit more thought to use. Now, that being said, um, however you end up deciding to go for those, once you see the Cupido bow, if you happen to have found a Crescent at that point, um, you can find these basically from random units in Farampa in the post game, uh, or if you manage to uh, get into a high end chapter four. Um, by which I mean you can actually break the level cap um, by recruiting units of a, of a higher level than you currently have, sending those units out, then recruiting levels, finding maps where they will get scaled up on, then you recruit those higher level units, etc, etc. You can basically just cheese the system to, uh, to unlock gear early. Um, but if you happen to find Crescent Bows, typically the easiest way to do it is uh, the first 25 floors of Palace of the Dead. They tend to drop fairly commonly. Um, but either way, you upgrade one of those into a Caputo bow, and this, uh, in the hands of archers, is a guaranteed mind control gun. Um, so, just eagle eye procs, they go ahead and fire it, and suddenly you have a new friend. Um, as far as crossbows go, these are more or less going to be directly, uh, mostly just going for stats, though I will say the bowgun plus one is of particular consideration, uh, having a stone effect on a class that can guarantee uh, secondaries. Um, so this is going to be great for uh, uh, for both uh, Dragoons and Archers in particular. Uh, not that there's really too many other things that can equip them, to be honest, but uh, either way. Um, not as impressive on the Vartan, though... I mean, with the Vartan, they're typically switching out enough that they may want to take the chance roll on the basic shot uh, stun. Um, 
I mean, I guess it's a reasonable enough thing. You really don't need attack power that much this time around. Though, I gotta say, um, uh, I was running a, uh, like a, a steel bow Canopus for a little bit there, and that was actually doing pretty all right, uh, simply because it switched his damage into a crushing profile, um, which, uh, tends to have a lot better armor resistances as stuff goes on, so, you know, might, uh, might work out a little bit better, but either way. So, um, then next up we got Fusils, you just upgrade directly to the next one. They're not exactly expensive, they're basically as soon as you unlock one, you've unlocked all of them. Um, Fire Temple unlocks the uh, second tier of guns, but uh, either way, uh, not really too much to talk about there. Um, as far as medicines go, something to bear in mind. Uh, Men Salve plus one will heal 75%. Our T cost is only 30, whereas the uh, the full heal off the Mending Essence is plus 40. Typically, this is going to be cheaper uh, on the whole. Like, if you make one, that is going to cost you 150. If you uh, make this one, it's going to cost you 300. Yes, you're getting that extra 25% healing. Realistically, most of the time, if you have a chance to heal, you're not at 2% health. You're probably already at like 25 to 30% health. This is, generally speaking, in most situations, going to be the one that you want to keep on hand. It's faster to use, it's half the cost, it's just a lot more bang for the buck there. Um, that being said, if you're looking for that infinite uh, MP item over here, uh, that would be this right here. Uh, so uh, the uh, uh, the fruit, uh, basically this is only 10% and 10%, but it's definitely worth keeping in mind. All right, next up are going to be the uh, shots. You do not want to, uh, you don't want to make these yourself. Uh, just buy them. Um, it's just, it's not worth wasting the resources on that. Um, these, um, again, I honestly, I would say the same thing. It's probably not worth making them yourself until you're way later, uh, just because the, uh, uh, the, uh, the kind of crystal, uh, cost involved is a bit too high, but, uh, either way, once you start getting pumpkins in pretty large numbers, this is pretty handy. Um, so early on would recommend auctioning and buying from the store, but then later on it's probably going to be a little bit, it's going to start edging towards being a little cheaper to just make them yourself. And then lastly, the last thing on the list is the old fork. So, obviously, you want to go fight some super bosses. That's when you, you uh, go ahead and uh, make yourself a fork, and then you run into one and then regret your decision. All right, so that is about that. Um, in, I guess aside from uh, materials and things, if you're wondering where certain things were made, like, for example, if you're wondering why I can't get a hold of these things, they're under here under materials. Um, they take these crystal things to make. They're effectively going to be your limiter in terms of how much you can make a lot of your elemental stuff uh, uh, from Chapter 4 and beyond. Um, generally speaking, just only make a handful of these at a time. Otherwise, you'll constantly wind up in that situation of uh, of accidentally over-investing in something and then regretting it and then wishing you didn't, but then realizing with a ton of dread that there's suddenly a whole, un a whole bunch more traveling you're going to have to do to get more. So just use these sparingly um that, that's what i was saying specifically about the orbs just don't go crazy with those uh the rest of this stuff will automatically offer itself up um on the uh, crafting screen so there's never really a need to worry about it but you have your item counts here if you want them um and then i i mean there's really no need to talk about upgrades this is fairly direct but either way um i feel like that about covers it uh, again generally you're looking more for secondary effects than anything else uh, once you get into your fancier variants later on you'll have you know a bit more effects on your items but for the most part you'll generally find a few things that uh, have some nice longevity to them um like specifically uh, you'll start noticing that uh, even something like your basic armor upgrades are going to last you a pretty decently long time um it's not much it's not a gigantic jump for stuff like this but you know, for example, something like a uh, like a brigandine there, it's gonna be um, it's gonna be something to at least last you out a little while longer. Um, overall, again, it's just not worth the cost in some cases. It's really only if you have those materials on hand already. But all right, that'll be that. Um, that's all for now. Uh, Y'all have a good one. Take care, and let me know uh, if there's any other questions.